In this problem, we're looking at a polynomial function with complex zeros. The question is, given this function, one of the zeros is 1 plus i, what are the other zeros? We're going to look at finding the answer in a few different ways, because some of these ways are interesting to me. So the first thing that I think we should realize is that when we have a polynomial with real coefficients, any complex zeros come in conjugate pairs. So I can say automatically that if 1 plus i is a 0, 1 minus i is another 0. I also know that th since this is a degree 3 polynomial, we're looking for a total of three zeros. So there's only one more 0 that we're after. I also know that if I put my zeros and write them uh, as the linear factors of this polynomial, I'm going to, for now, call this third 0 c, so I can write it in factored form x minus c, and if I'm going to multiply these factors together, it should equal our original polynomial. So I can divide the polynomial by the product of these two factors, and I'll be left with our last factor, which would give us our last zero. So next is to multiply these two factors together. I'd like to actually remove this inner set of parentheses and do a three terms by three terms multiplication. You can do a FOIL with keeping the 1 plus i and 1 minus i in parentheses. My preference is just multiply 3 by 3. As I do the multiplications, I'm going to also try to line up my like terms. I'm starting with the x and distributing the x to each of these three terms. Now the negative 1. I'm keeping all my like terms in columns, so I've got several columns now. And now distribute the negative i. Now that minus i times i is a negative i squared. Since i squared is negative 1, that turns into this positive 1 that I have there. And now I'll just combine these like terms. So what we're looking at is the product of these two factors is x squared minus 2x plus 2. So if I go to the polynomial and divide this by x squared minus 2x plus 2, I'll end up with the last factor, and then I can see the last 0. So that's what we're about to do right now. I've set up this division using long division, and we'll go from here. Remember what we're looking for is, to start off, this x squared should be multiplied by what to get us to x cubed. That's all we're thinking about in terms of how do we come up with the terms in our answer. We only use the negative 2x and the positive 2 when we're ready to multiply back down. So we'll see how this looks. I've multiplied the x down to each term. The next part is to do a subtract, and my preference is always that I flip these signs and add. I'm going to go ahead and do that. We see some things cancel. We'll bring down the plus 20 and do our round 2. Now we're thinking about x squared times what would equal 10x squared. And finding that positive 10, we're going to multiply back down. OK. Now I don't really need to flip signs and add this time because I can really see that I've got identical terms that when I subtract, I have a remainder of 0. And that's excellent because we were expecting a remainder of 0. Why? Well, we knew that this is a factor. It's actually two of our linear factors multiplied together, but it's still another factor of this polynomial. And if we divide out a factor, we should have no remainder. OK, and now our answer, x plus 10, is our final factor of this polynomial. That means our 0, let's just set this equal to 0 and solve, x equals negative 10. That's our final 0 to go along with 1 plus i and 1 minus i. A similar kind of approach would be one where we begin by dividing out our known 0, and we can use synthetic division for this part. We're using the, our known 0, 1 plus i, as the divisor. I've brought down the coefficients from the polynomial, 1, positive 8, negative 18, 20. And synthetic division will work with complex numbers the same way that it will with real numbers. Just make sure that we follow all the rules for complex numbers.
when I multiply back up, I will have to distribute, and when I add back down, I can only do like terms. Multiply back up. Now this is going to have to be a FOIL, 9 plus i times 1 plus i. I've just done the four multiplications. Now I'll combine like terms and simplify that i squared into a negative 1. Leaves us with 8 plus 10i. Then we'll add back down. Multiply back up. It looks like another FOIL, but I see something else going on here. Um, this negative 10 plus 10i, if I factor out a negative 10, we're left with 1 minus i. And when we multiply that by 1 plus i, now I can see I have conjugates here. That's going to make my multiplication a little bit easier, I guess. 1 plus 1 is 2. Negative 10 times 2 equals negative 20. There's our remainder 0, which we definitely expected. We knew 1 plus i is a 0, so it should divide from our polynomial and leave a remainder of 0. What we have left, we could do a couple of different things. We could do synthetic division again if I choose to, to recognize that these complex zeros do come in conjugate pairs. So I could do synthetic division again with 1 minus i. Or, one approach I like is when I'm left with only three terms down here, I know I have basically what could be thought of as like a quadratic equation. And I can solve this quadratic equation with the quadratic formula. a is our coefficient 1, b is this coefficient 9 plus i, and c is the basically like the constant, but these this complex negative 10 plus 10i. Here's where we are after plugging in our values for a, b, c into the quadratic formula. I do have a bit of algebra with complex numbers to work here. I'll start with what I see inside the radical, and I'll, I'll start with this 9 plus i squared. I should probably know this one in my head, but it never hurts to write it out. 9i, 9i is 18i. i squared is negative 1, so this is 80 plus 18i. Okay, all this is going to be just a distribute, negative 4 distributed, distributed this negative 4 through, and now we have some like terms inside this radical, but we're going to have a complex number in this radical. We'll have 120 minus 22i. So now I think we need to take a little bit of time to work what is the square root of 120 minus 22i. Here's one way that we can find the square root of a complex number. The square root of a complex number is going to also equal some other complex number. So I can write it in the form a plus bi. Now I will work to, well, let's square both sides. That will remove the radical. Over here, a squared plus 2abi. This would be plus b squared i squared, but i squared is negative 1. We can go right to minus b squared. What we're looking at now is an equation that contains real parts and complex parts. And since those two types cannot be combined ever, that means that the real parts that we see in this equation can be pulled out into their own equation. The 120 has to be a result from a squared minus b squared, and we can do the same with the complex parts. Negative 22i must equal 2abi. Okay, the complex and the reals cannot ever mix, so if I see a 120 on the left side and it's real, it can only equal the a squared minus b squared because they are real. This 2abi will have no part in making up 120 because this is complex, this is real, so this is valid, just pulling out the reals into their own equation, pulling out the complex into their own equation. Now we have two equations and we have two unknowns, the a and the b. If we can find a and b, we'll know that those numbers go here and here, and that will be the answer to just this radical. Uh, so we're going to try to do a little bit of substitution. On the complex side, I'll remove the i's, basically divide i from both sides, we're looking at negative 22 equals 2ab. 
Divide both sides by 2, negative 11 equals AB. And we'll do a substitution. I'll solve for B, I suppose. Negative 11 over A equals B. Now we'll substitute this in place of B in our other equation. 120 equals A squared minus negative 11 over A squared. We're going to try to solve this. Now we're looking at, well, we've got a rational equation here. I want to get rid of this fraction. I'll multiply all my terms by A squared. And this equation now is quadratic in form. I can solve this using quadratic methods. I'll bring it up here and write it in standard form. I'm bringing basically the 120a squared over to the right side. a fourth minus 120a squared minus 121. We could even factor this. Factored, now we will solve a squared equals 121 and a squared equals negative 1. That leaves us with a equals a positive or negative 11 or positive or negative i. I can actually, since A represented the real part, focus on just these solutions, but I'll actually show you what would happen if I consider the I as well. With the value of A, I'll go one by one. If A is positive 11, I'll insert A into this equation to find out what is B. If A is positive, positive 11, then B would be negative 11 over 11, that's negative 1. And as a complex number, that would be 11 minus I. If A equals negative 11, then negative 11 over negative 11 is positive 1, and that would give us the complex number negative 11 plus I. Okay, we have those two so far. Let's see what happens when we use A equals positive I. Then B would be negative 11 over I and let's rationalize the denominator. Multiply top and bottom by i. That will give us negative 11i. And i times i is i squared. That's negative 1. So this becomes a positive 11i. And what would that look like as a complex number? Well, if a is now i and b, this coefficient on i, that b is 11i. Don't forget that built-in i is there. So the math has told us that this is what our complex number should look like. If a is i and b is 11i, here's our complex number. But we can do a little bit of simplifying here. 11i times i, that's 11i squared. And i squared is negative 1, so this is really i plus negative 11. And now if I put the real part first, and the complex part second, negative 11 plus i, that's a, re a repeater. See, negative 11 plus i is what we found with negative 11 for a, and b equals 1. And the same thing will happen when we choose that last value. If we chose a equals negative i, we'll get another repeater. So that's basically why we can let that one go and only work with a equals positive or negative 11. And it left us with these two as square root of 120 minus 22i equals either 11 minus i or negative 11 plus i. Now remember, this was just part of our quadratic equation, so let's go back and finish that. We're back to our quadratic formula. That square root that we found here was, we had two versions, either 11 minus i or negative 11 plus i. If I start by putting in the 11 minus i, now let's see what happens when we incorporate in this plus or minus. And maybe you're starting to see that if we use the plus, we'll use 11 minus i. But if I go and use the negative, that makes this negative 11 plus i. And that's exactly what we got as our other square root here. So I'm actually going to find my result, find my final answer, just from this fraction right here. I will not need to go next and put in negative 11 plus i, our other result from the square root, because the mathematics will be exactly the same as the two fractions we'll come up with using an add for one and the subtract for the other. Let's do that. Negative 9 minus i 
and we'll use the plus. So plus 11 minus i all over 2. Let's combine our like terms. That will give us 2 minus 2i over 2. And we can cancel. We can divide each of those terms by 2. That leaves us with 1 minus i. All right, now, we should have known all along that these complex zeros come in conjugate pairs, but it's just been confirmed now. 1 plus i was given. There's the 1 minus i. And do you remember from way back when, when we did the other version, we knew what our third zero was. We came up with it. So we have an idea of what number we should come up with here. When we do negative 9 minus i, now we're using the subtract. So it's minus 11. And don't forget minus negative i. So that becomes plus i over 2. Combine our like terms. Negative 9 with negative 11 is negative 20. I didn't leave enough room for negative i plus i cancel. Didn't even need it. And that's where we're seeing our last 0 at negative 10. Now I'm going back to this part of the problem where we first decided that we could multiply our two known factors together and divide that out from our polynomial to find the third factor. But I'm going to do things in a little bit of a different way for just another option of what we could do. We know the product of these two factors, x squared minus 2x plus 2. I'm going to go ahead and multiply this by this third factor. Right now it's still unknown, x minus c. And I'll do the multiplication here. Now I'm going to try to combine like terms. I know that won't be possible because I have some variables and some numbers as coefficients. I'm just going to try to write them in a way where I'm grouping them together. So when I get to these x squares, I'm going to say this is minus c plus 2x squared. Okay, so I took out the minus c and this negative 2 together with the x squared. With these two terms, I'll have a 2c plus 2 with the x, and the last, the constant, minus 2c. Now we know that this polynomial right here must equal this x cubed plus 8x squared minus 18x plus 20. And we, we can even use an idea that we used with the, squeeze that in there, with the complex root when we parsed apart the real and the complex terms from an equation to come up with two separate equations. We're going to do something very similar right here. Okay, x cubed we have on the left side. That x cubed must correspond with this x cubed on the right side. This x cubed cannot be made up from any of these other terms because they are not like terms. So what I can do is term by term set these things equal to each other. The next one would be negative c plus 2 is on this x squared, so it must equal a positive 8. I don't have to worry about this negative 18 because that is in this first degree term. It does not have anything to do with what might possibly be the coefficient on the second degree term. So looking at these two terms in an equation, we have negative c plus 2 equals 8. Can we solve this equation? Negative c minus 2 equals 8. That would give us negative c equals 10. I'm going, to, going around in a circle, and now c equals negative 10. Well, we actually found with those other methods. Can we get a, a confirmation if we look at the first degree terms, 2c plus 2? And our coefficient on first degree x over here is negative 18. And let's solve this. 2c equals negative 20, so c equals negative 10. We can even see with the constants, this negative 2c would be considered our constant because it doesn't have a variable in that term. Does negative 2c equal, well, it does equal positive 20. Does that still work? to give us c equals negative 10. So even one more option to come up with that third zero for this polynomial function.